Hello everyone. Um, I think I'm just going to start. Uh, welcome to tonight's Truth and Reconciliation colloquium on Rwanda reconciliation between the Hutus and Tutsis. During the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, up to 1 million people perished and as many as 250,000 women were raped, leaving the country's population traumatized and its infrastructure decimated. Since then, Rwanda has embarked on an ambitious justice and reconciliation process with the ultimate aim of all Rwandans once again living side by side in peace. Our first speaker, Valerie Gatabazi, is a uh, native Rwandan. She's currently working with um, organizations both in Rwanda and Australia. In Rwanda, she's the public relations coordinator for CHAMP which is Community HIV AIDS Mobilization Program, funded by USAID. Um, and she's also, the, in Australia, she's the Settlement Coordinator for the African Communities Council of SA. In this role, she helps Africans in the settlement process, including organizing information and training sessions to equip them with information and skills that they need to prosper in Australia. <coughs> Valerie's illustrious education um, started when she graduated from the University of Burundi with a uh, license in Sciences Humaines uh, Letters Francais. She's also a trainer in Gender and Development, Conflict Resolution, Leadership, Micro Enterprises and Project Cycle. She's also the community leader with the Rwandan community of South Australia, a member of Activate Church Adelaide, and a volunteer at MRC Migrant Resource Centre as well as in Turkey. Thank you for your kind introduction. Good evening, everyone. As she said, I'm Valerie Gatabazi. I'm from Rwanda, and I'm a survivor of the genocide. Tonight, we are gathering to share about genocide against Tutsi, which happened in April 1994, 20 years ago, and reconciliation, because we acknowledge the humanity that binds us together in remembering the past the horrors of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda 20 years ago, the immeasurable suffering, pain, and loss which left a country and people without any hope. April 2014 marks the 20th anniversary of the genocide that killed one million Tutsi in 100 days in Rwanda. Today, Rwandan have shown an incredible resilience and determination in rebuilding the country and renewing a sense of hope in the future. Today, Rwanda has become a past child of post-conflict, peace rebuilding, and recovery with strong levels of economic growth and investment, free of corruption, and with impressive achievements in health, education, and especially women's participation. <coughs> Rwandans have pursued justice and reconciliation as best they could, but it does it not restore what they have lost. Time and again, these past 20 years, Rwandans have given of themselves. They have stood before the community to bear the witness and listen 
to others to the same. Rwandans have taken responsibility and have forgiven. The forgiveness is the seed from which the new Rwanda grows. The people who planned and carried out the genocide were Rwandans. But the history and roots causes go beyond the country. This is why Rwandans continue to seek the most complete explanation possible for what happened. Rwandans do so with humility as a nation that nearly destroyed itself. When Rwandans speak out about the roles and responsibilities of external actors and institutions, it's because genocide prevention demands historical clarity of all of us. Not because Rwandans wish to shift blame onto others. All genocide begin with an ideology. A system, a system of ideas that say this group of people here, they are less than human and they deserve to be exterminated. The ideology was in place since the 19th century with the full participation of Belgian officials and Catholic institutions. This invented history was made the only basis of political organization. The colonial theory of Rwandan society claimed that hostility between Hutu, Tutsi, and Twa was permanent and necessary. This was divide to rule. This was the beginning of the genocide against Tutsi as we saw it 20 years ago. Today, Rwanda is the only African country on track to meet all the Millennium Development Goals by 2015 and has the highest percentage of women in parliament compared to any country in the world, 64%. <laughs> After the genocide, according to UNICEF, women in Rwanda represented 70% of the population. And the government took proactive policy stance to include women and men equally as ideal foundation for development. Women have made key contribution to healing, peace, reconciliation, and reconstruction by facilitating survivors and perpetrators working together for their communities and the nation. The 2014 World Bank Doing Business Report rated Rwanda as having the second business environment in Africa. And the country is regarded as being one of the safest, cleanest, and most peaceful country in Africa today. One of the char characteristics that have made this remarkable progress possible has been the Rwandan government policy of unity and reconciliation. In 1999, the government of Rwanda established the National Unity and Reconciliation Commission and decided to adapt the traditional gachacha community justice and reconciliation. Through these national institutions, 
and the work of local and international civil society organizations, Rwandans have been encouraged to confess the crimes of the past, to reconcile and to live together peacefully. For the good of the country and the future, feelings of anger and the desire for revenge have been buried in the hope that future generations of Rwandans will grow up free of the prejudice and interethnic violence of the past. As a result of the experience in 1994, Rwandans have been committed to the global effort to prevent genocide, including the creation of a national commission for the fight against genocide, CNLG. In its determination to avoid being a bystander to massive violence, Rwanda has also become a significant global contributor to peacekeeping missions, including Darfur in South Sudan, Haiti, Côte d'Ivoire, Mali, Liberia, and Central Africa. Genocide prevention and reconciliation is a significant focus on the 20th commemoration of the genocide against Tutsi program around the world, everywhere where Rwandese are as a diaspora, they are doing from April to July the 20th commemoration of genocide, and this is the focus. Some people who don't want, who don't know much about the genocide, ask me, why do Rwandans remember every year? From 7th of April to 4th of July. And this is my answer. Because that was the 100 days of the genocide, which took one million of lives of innocent people only because they were born to see. It's extremely hard to go through the process of remembering. It's not an easy process, but as survivors, we have an obligation to remember so that the memories of our loved ones live on and so that we make sure to learn some lessons for the future, for the next generations. Very quickly after the genocide, the people of Rwanda refused to be overwhelmed by death and despair and undertook courageously pick up the pieces and rebuild a new and strong nation by using a number of homegrown solutions, including the traditional gachacha courts, which focuses on restora restorative rather than retributive justice, and thereby foster reconciliation. Imihigo, a performance contract between the leaders and the leads, which ensures transparency and accountability. Ubudehe, a solidarity system at village level, which ensures that the weak members of the society are not left out, but are collectively assisted and supported by those who are strong and Uganda, a collective community work and at addressing community problems such as building classrooms 
and cleaning the neighborhood among others. In conclusion, I will tell you that reconciliation is a reality in Rwanda based on facts. Rwanda chose to stay together when the Hutu refugees came home. They were welcomed by the Tutsi neighbors and assisted in the resettlement. When the genocide suspects were released from prison in anticipation of the traditional gachacha justice, when the government extended comprehensive new education and health benefits to all citizens without any discrimination. The accountability is a reality in Rwanda. An official who abuses their powers or engages in any form of corruption, no matter how high ranking will face justice and go through the sanction as the law says. The survivors of the genocide believe that the hard choices made by the government are leading the country somewhere better. That's why they cooperate fully. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to me. just like to say that Lucky Gire is the um, host today. So, Lucky Gire, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ron. What an incredible, I guess, presentation um, that I've just heard. I mean, I was very moved. As a native Somali, I can identify a lot with what you said, and I can hopefully um, my country will be able to learn from yours and can start its own reconciliation process. Our next speaker is Lynn Arnold, a highly experienced leader and manager of humanitarian and tribal organizations. He is currently the CEO of Anglicare South Australia, which you just left there, sorry about that. Um, He's also an adjunct professor at St. Barbara's Theological College, where he's also a full-time student. Um, he's the Reconciliation Ambassador of Reconciliation South Australia. He's a Knight of the Order of St. John, um, as well as a Justice Advocate at Prison Fellowship Australia. He's previously worked um, as CEO of World Vision Australia and as a member of Cabinet in the South Australian Government. Lynn holds a PhD in Sociolinguistics from the University of Adelaide and today he'll be presenting a talk about truth and reconciliation in Rwanda. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Lucky, and uh, I'm sorry I had to dash out and get the right presentation. I loaded the wrong one on the, on the flash drive, so anyway, I'm here. So I'm sorry about it, I missed what you had to say, but I know from the previous time you and I have spoken together what a powerful uh, commentary you make on what's happened in Rwanda. My first visit to Rwanda was in 1997, uh, when I had been only some weeks in the employ of uh, World Vision. 
I was their CEO, and the first thing they thought they would do was send me to uh, Rwanda to uh, see the work that was going on.